Okay. Uh, dear guests, uh, dear speakers, I hope you hear me. Um, let me kindly welcome you today at this important event. After nine months of this full-scale invasion of Ukraine by the Russian army at the SKD, we are very happy to give a platform to our colleagues again to talk about Ukrainian culture and projects to try to figure out what would be the strategies for the future already now. Uh, I will keep myself short and I'm here just to welcome all the speakers. Um, Evgenia Belarusic, Misha Gabovic, Nikita Kadan, Valentinas Kle uh, Klimashauskas, and uh, Doreen Mende, and our wonderful uh, moderator and my future colleague, Tatiana Kuchubinska, who will hopefully be soon with us at Dresden at the SKD as a co-curator for Ukrainian uh, exhibition, which we're working currently right now on. I would also like to say thanks to the SKD team and our technical support team who is making this possible today. And um, actually this project was also made possible with a grant from the Culture uh, of Solidarity Oinik Ukraine Fund in partnership with the European Cultural Foundation and Oinik with core financing led by Goethe Institute and additional funding by the Institut Frances and Instituto Cervantes. We would also like to thank Estonia Embassy in Berlin, Estonian Institute, Finnish Institute, and Lithuanian Institute for their endorsements and support. And here I would like to give the word to Tatiana Kochubinska, our moderator tonight. Thank you. Uh, dear Maria, thank you for the introduction. And dear speakers, thank you for being here. And uh, uh, agreeing to participate in the discussion and thank you for your future contribution and I'm also happy to welcome the audience I, I cannot see here whether we have audience at the moment but uh, if we have of course everyone is welcome uh, our discussion today is called uh, decoloniality in Ukraine is it still a place for a Soviet soldier in historic memory uh, so we will be talking today about the question of um, uh, uncomfortable past, uncomfortable shared past about some unspoken pages uh, in our history. And first of all, I would like to uh, welcome again the speakers, uh, as Maria mentioned, all of you, but uh, I would like to say some details about your practices. And uh, like, I'm very happy to talk today with Evgenia Belarusic, an artist and writer and photographer whose work uh, is often produced on the intersection of visual arts, journalism, activism, uh, and also literature. Uh, I'm very happy that we also have as a speaker, Misha Gabovic, who is a historian and sociologist who has written a number of books and publications about the topic of memory, commemorative practices, war memorials, and who is currently a Liz Meitner Fellow at the University of Vienna's Research Center for the History of Transformation. Uh, I'm very happy to welcome Nikita Kadan, uh, who is artist working in a variety of media, but whose main topic and the subject matter of research is the memory, collective memory, how we deal with the memory and the past, uh, often linking to the avant-garde practices. And also I'm happy to uh, welcome Valentinas Klimashauskas, a curator and writer who for a while had been a curator of the Contemporary Art Center in Vilnius and also co -curator, uh, curator and co-curator of many exhibitions with Endless Frontier um, at the Baltic Tri Triennial, which is one of the recent projects. And um, yeah, and uh, as I said in the start that our discussion has its title, uh, with the uh, decoloniality in Ukraine is a still a space uh, for a Soviet soldier in historic memory. And basically this title of the discussion re refers to a very recent event uh, that happened right now, like in, in, in Ukraine in October. And um, it's uh, connected to the explosion of the monument to soldiers of law and order, uh, which was erected in 1977 by two Soviet Ukrainian sculptors, Yuri Makushin and Inna Makushina. And basically uh, this is a monument which uh, was devoted to the police officers who died during the Second World War or died during the Civil War. And basically, um, 
this monument, when it was erected, it was mentioned, it was meant to mark the anniversary of creation of the Soviet militia, but it's also, uh, I think it's really important um, detail how this monument was erected uh, that in a way uh, it was something like crowdfunding campaign because it was not only a part of the propaganda monument but at the same time it contained all the personal testimonies of people who just wanted to uh, to have something like in memory of the deceased uh, relatives and uh, in the context of contemporary realia, when we are in the very like really hard phase uh, of war. Um, in this context, this figure of a soldier, like this monument, which has been exploded and basically destroyed today, uh, the figure of a soldier becomes a metaphor to think about the Soviet as such in the historic memory of our country that at the moment is trying to realize this process very quick and rapid process uh, of decolonization. And so during the discussion, I would like also to talk about this term, because uh, on the one hand, it's becoming like a very urgent agenda, but at the same time, speaking about decolonization uh, becomes a trend of the recent months. But at the same time, I think it's important to reflect upon the terminology itself. Uh, what do we mean by decolonization in Ukraine? Can we use this term in relation, for example, uh, of Ukraine to the Soviet Union? How, how we can initiate a discussion? And if we can start this discussion in the situation which is very much complex today, when we are in the hot stage of war, um, can we build complex narrative or it's not the time to do it? And um, also, like I would like to focus on the questions of the uncomfortable past. And I said before uh, about the unspoken pages of the history and today, even probably, sorry to repeat again, but really when we have this war between Russia and Ukraine, how we can deal with this shared and comfortable past, but trying not to use the practices of exclusion or strategies of negation, is it possible? So uh, this is a set of questions that we would like and I would like to tackle today. And first of all, I would like to invite to, to give the word to Misha Gabovic, uh, who is a historian and sociologist, will give a more theoretical framework towards this set of questions that we would like to talk about. So please, Misha, you're welcome to start. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to talk about uh, the topic from a historical perspective. Can you all see my presentation? Yeah. Um, but I would like to start actually by respectfully disagreeing with Tatiana and the way that she framed our discussion, because uh, what it says in uh, the invitation text is that monuments, figures of soldiers, are metaphors for thinking about the Soviet, and that they are essentially about narratives, linear, non-linear, complex narratives. Now, what I would like to argue is that monuments are different from narratives in that they are material objects and that very much defines the ways they come into being and the ways that we interact with them and also i do think that war memorials specifically since this is what we are talking about can be seen as metaphors for the soviet as such because there are a number of points uh, on which war memorials soviet war memorials differ from all other soviet statues. So having said that, uh, let's delve into the history. So um, we very often think of Soviet monument building policy as centralized because clearly the Soviet state had totalitarian ambitions. But um, what's ironic and maybe unexpected is that in fact, almost all European countries had central agencies that were set up after the first world war to build monuments, to build war memorials and to organize commemorative activities around them. And the Soviet Union was the major exception because the First World War was seen as uh, a bourgeois imperialist war. So the Soviet Union actually never created an agency like uh, the Imperial War Graves Commission, the Volksbund Deutsche Kriegsgräberfürsorge, etc., which led to the counterintuitive situation that war memorials in the Soviet Union were built, planned, designed, initiated 
by a huge variety of different actors. So um, a few major projects, uh, those that we tend to know about, were initiated by the main political or military leaders, though even there, the initiative often belonged to ambitious sculptors and architects who secured political patronage. But the vast majority of war memorials in the Soviet Union were built outside of major symbolic locations, especially in rural regions, and they were commissioned and built by a variety of different actors. So it's important to understand that, of course, different parts of empires are always ruled differently, right? Empires are never homogeneous. And Soviet monument building policies were no exception. So immediately after 1945, many monument building projects on the periphery of uh, the Soviet Union, uh, near the new borders of the empire, were imperialist or more precisely geopolitical. So the point was to demonstrate the Soviet character of border regions by building bronze soldiers or other reminders of Soviet military sacrifice and heroism. This happened in Tallinn, this happened in Yerevan, but it also happened in Ujhorod and Viv. But in other places, local initiative was key in monument building activities. So in Crimea, the Leningrad region, but also in Stanislav, Vinnytsia, Kasnodon, monuments were initiated, designed and built by army units, by military engineers, by local architects and sculptors, by bosses of the local kolkhoz or the local executive committee. Some of them were also financed, commissioned and built by just regular people, such as surviving relatives of Holocaust victims. Now, I have a, an electronic image from Ukraine. This isn't a very uh, nice example from Belarus, from Arkady Zelser's book about Holocaust memorials in the Soviet Union. So in the first two decades after 1945, Ukraine was the Soviet Republic that was most active in terms of both building monuments and organizing commemorative ceremonies about them. And both monuments and commemoration were certainly used to silence memories of the war that did not fit the Soviet canon. But it would be a vast oversimplification to say that they were a colonial imposition from Moscow. Very, very often the initiative came from local actors. That doesn't mean that they were, you know, grassroots people trying to revolt against the official narrative, but they were local and they were following their own local logics. And in 1965, it was the leader of the Ukrainian Communist Party, Petro Sheles, who was the first to suggest reintroducing Victory Day, the 9th of May, as a union-wide work-free holiday, and who pointed out the, the different commemorative ceremonies around monuments that had developed in Ukraine by that time. And in some sense, what is often simplistically referred to as the cult of the Great Patriotic War, or Brezhnev's cult of the Great Patriotic War, was in fact a program to take up models and practices that had developed in Ukraine, but also in Belarus, in Moldova, in the Baltics, and elsewhere, especially in places, territories that had previously been occupied by the Germans and their allies, and to take these, these practices and homogenize them across the entire Soviet Union. And as a result of this new centralized attention to war memory, many older monuments, were replaced with newer ones, and generally war commemoration and monument building moved from the countryside to the cities. So what's important to understand is that what many of us know as the kind of canonical culture of monuments and war commemoration that we associate with the late Soviet Union was actually a relatively late invention that was in a sense a continuation of something that had been developed before and something that had been developed especially in Ukraine and the surrounding republics, and that also had looked very, very different. Now, um, let's look briefly at the post-Soviet period. Uh, so what happens with uh, war memorials in the post-Soviet period? I'm focusing very much on Ukraine here. So uh, there's, there's this sort of idea um, that we often have that a lot of war memorials were destroyed immediately after 1991. Um, actually, there were a few cases like that of monuments being destroyed or removed. But actually, in a lot of countries, and especially in Ukraine, those were really the exception rather than the rule. And all the way to the decommunization campaign of 1915, 16, 17, in fact, even when Lenin statues and statues of other leaders were removed, in the vast, vast majority of cases, war memorials uh, were left untouched and, in fact, remained centers of commemorative ceremonies. 
So um, instead of removal, actually, there were a lot of other ways in which people uh, have treated uh, war memorials. One is inventory, because since there was never a centralized agency in the Soviet Union to build these monuments, but also to take stock of them, after uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, a lot of people, state agencies, but also individuals, started uh, collecting catalogs, lists, inventories. And this is uh, one example among many of a site, this one is, is focused on Ukraine, that tries to um, kind of create a database of, of uh, existing memorials. Uh, another thing that happened, and that has happened quite a lot in, in Ukraine, to a surprising degree, is the construction of new memorials in the traditional Soviet war monuments. This is one example among many from the Kherson region. This is a memorial that will probably look Soviet to many of you, but that was actually built in the post-Soviet period. And we find quite a lot of examples uh, of this kind, especially in the southern and eastern parts of Ukraine. Now, another very, very common way of treating war memorials has been to either reinterpret them or to modify them. Uh, and this is something you find very often, this is an example from West Ukraine, a photo I took a few years ago, uh, a very, very typical example of a war memorial in a rural region being slightly modified. So what happened here is that there was an inscription about uh, the Soviet fatherland and people simply uh, deleted the word Soviet but left everything else in place and then they added a Christian cross. Uh, what often happens in uh, eastern regions of Ukraine, and this is uh, from field work by my colleague uh, Mykola Homanyuk from Kherson, is that people um, regularly repaint monuments in these really garish and, and sort of polychrome uh, color schemes as a way, uh, on the one hand, to um, save and protect them from the weather, but also to somehow you know, express their continued reverence. Uh, and um, yeah, here's another example of this. And then finally, we have a few examples, and I'm sure that Nikita Kadan will talk more about this, of artistic intervention. That's uh, an exception rather than the rule, and there have not been all that many performances of this kind. Now, very quickly, um, I want to spend a few minutes talking about what has been happening since February, and this is based on research that I've been doing with uh, Mikola Omanyu, my, my colleague from Kyrson. We're currently writing a book together about uh, the treatment of both Soviet and post-Soviet war memorials on the, the territories of Ukraine that have been occupied by the Russians since uh, February. Now, um, this has led, first of all, to indirect effects in that, unlike what we saw before February, actually now there is a wave of iconoclasm, which has also um, reached war memorials in different parts of the non-occupied parts of Ukraine. So here are a few examples of monuments that have been demolished, removed, etc. But the examples that I'm showing you here um, are typically of removal on the orders of uh, a local municipal authority, right? Uh, except this one here um, in, uh, with the case of, of Rukov in Kharkiv, um, which is kind of self-organized, but in many, many cases, there was actually an official decision by a municipal council. Um, something else that has happened is that the advancing Russian forces have actually destroyed, um, you know, inadvertently destroyed a number of war memorials, even though part of their justification for invading was that supposedly the Ukrainians uh, aren't taking good care of, of uh, memorials of the Great Patriotic War. But, but what they did themselves is that um, through their, their shelling and artillery fire, um, they actually damaged uh, a number of uh, memorials of this kind. Uh, and then they also started deliberately targeting some memorials, including memorials of the Great Patriotic War, especially if they uh, featured any sort of Ukrainian symbols, or even as in this case, uh, just an inscription in Ukrainian. Uh, something else that has happened uh, quite a lot is that the Russians come in, install uh, an administration, and then they make a great propaganda show of rebuilding or reconstructing monuments of the Great Patriot War, uh, kind of surrounding this with discourse about the evil Ukrainian Nazi regime not having taken care of these memorials, either for the past eight years or even maybe for the past 30 years. Um, the problem being, of course, is that in the vast, vast majority of cases, this is completely untrue because these memorials tend to be in very good shape. 
uh, they have been, uh, you know, people have been taking care of them, organizing ceremonies around them. So what they do is they engage in what I call spurious reconstruction. So they try to pretend that they're doing something to reconstruct these monuments, but since these monuments were not in need of reconstruction, um, what happens is that, for example, they start uh, repainting them in all sorts of bizarre colors, as in, in this case, or they start uh, painting individual elements of monuments, um, even in, in those cases, which is the vast majority, where, of course, the sculptors and architects never intended for these monuments to be uh, covered with paint. Uh, something else that has happened from the Ukrainian side is that a lot of people in the occupied territories have used these Soviet war memorials as canvases for anti-occupation messages. So uh, you see here an example from the Kherson region where people spray anti-Putin graffitis or Ukrainian flag on war memorials, in a sense, appropriating them for their own cause against the Russian invasion. And then um, the other thing that has happened is that uh, images and videos of war memorials have been extremely important to war propaganda from the Russian side, but have also been used by the Ukrainian side. And um, from the uh, Ukrainian side, very often they sort of give legitimacy, uh, sorry, from the, the Russian side, they're they, uh, supposed to give legitimacy to the invasion, um, say that, you know, these have always been Russian lands and we have defended them then, we will defend them now, uh, from, you know, the imaginary Nazis. Um, they also use camera angles in very interesting hierarchical ways to broadcast these memorials. So I don't have time to go into this. They engage in a sort of reconstruction or reenactment of poses of war memorials. Um, they relight uh, eternal flames, etc. Um, but uh, what has also happened, yeah, so they, they sort of circulate images uh, to, to pretend that Ukraine is not taking good care of war memorials. They try to defend them from imaginary things. Uh, but what is happening from the Ukrainian side is that um, the, the way that war memorials are presented has also been very important. So for the Ukrainian side, it's also been uh, very important to sort of show continuity between the fight for the fatherland in 1945 to 1940, uh, 1941 to 1945 and today. But the visual presentation has been very different. Unlike the sort of hierarchical uh, top-down or low camera angles that are very common in Russian propaganda, from the Ukrainian side, you typically see these horizontal selfie shots where people talking today and the, uh, in the figures that are part of the monuments are presented as being on the same level. Um, and something else uh, that has been very common is to use images of war memorials as symbols of the destruction wrought by the Russian side but also to uh, kind of send monuments into battle. As in this case, some of you may have seen uh, at least the online version of this exhibition organized by the Museum of uh, Ukraine in the Second World War in Kiev, which is housed in the, um, the uh, motherland statue uh, that is one of the symbols of Kiev. And uh, it featured uh, well over 100 drawings and uh, videos of this iconic statue being kind of reimagined as uh, a figure fighting now for Ukraine against Russia. So it's important to understand that uh, monuments, especially war memorials, will always have a range of different meanings for different people, right? And obviously I didn't have very, very much time to show um, this whole, the whole specter of these meanings, but even from these few examples, you can probably see that uh, monuments and memorials have been extremely important to both sides in this ongoing war. Um, and outsiders typically will look primarily at the outward symbols, right? And for example, they will take offense at the presence of a red star, hammer and sickle, and interpret a monument as objectively symbolizing the Soviet past, the Soviet regime, the crimes of the Soviet Union, etc. But for many local residents, uh, monuments have a primarily local and even intimate significance. So people don't usually see them as markers of a Soviet identity, but as parts of a familiar landscape or as sacred places that they come to to commemorate their own families, even when their specific family histories aren't directly connected to these specific monuments. So, you know, as a, as, as a researcher, as a historian, it's not my place to give any recommendations, but what I want to point out is that previous experience, not just in Ukraine, but also in countries like Poland and many others, shows that the least conflictual way to remove a monument or to alter its significance 
is to have some sort of interaction, some sort of debate about it that involves residents and that allows them to voice all these different meanings that the monuments are infused with. Whereas top-down campaigns where people just decide to uh, remove or uh, demolish a monument very often lead to new conflicts and can even breed revanchist sentiments such as the ones that have been used by the Russian side in the invasion today. I think that's my time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your talk. And uh, now I would, I would like to give a word to Evgenia. And yeah, unmute. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Misha. It was really great, interesting, and I'm very inspired. Um, I will uh, speak about uh, several projects of mine uh, that are related to our discussion and make even a proposition uh, with a term uh, connected to child psychology and um, uh, the term of Jean Peugeot that sounds like decentration that I, I, I am proposing instead or together with decolonization. Um, I will start I, I just I, I just was thinking that um, I can I can show here fragments of my project Victories of the Defeated that I started in 2014 um, working in different cities in the eastern Ukraine uh, practically document documenting um, the life of mines coal mines that were working on the age of war, looking actually for a um, way to represent a war, uh, to represent the work in the situation of war and to understand what cultural um, traditions uh, are connected to the working process uh, in different cities of the eastern Ukraine and um, what what would be our heritage maybe of of of, of this way of life that we are in the pro that we were in in the process of losing because war was happening uh, in on on this territory putting everyone in danger and slowly destroying this uh, ways of of living the life working and de destroying everyday life uh, when I was traveling, I was actually hoping uh, that um, that um, of course in 2014 uh, I, I was having some hopes that uh, lots of cities um, in this region uh, would be on some level untouched um, by the huge violence of, of the war. Um, which wasn't happening again and again. And it started with uh, the city of Dibaltseva, uh, which I visited in 2014. It was a very interesting um, interesting place because it was a first, I would say, first late victim of Russian aggression. Uh, um, that uh, the city that was violently occupied after all Minsk um, agreements between uh, um, Ukraine, Russia, European countries, after all, all peaceful agreements. And um, the city was situated actually between uh, two newborn uh, third states, LNR and DNR. Uh, and um, it was, of course, a very important railway railway junction and therefore maybe it was also important to occupy it by um, um, by Russian forces that were representing themselves as DNR and LNR militia. So um, when I visited the city, I actually um, already at that time have seen the strange these big changes to all important um, 
places that were connecting practically uh, so Soviet past with the new history of Ukraine. Uh, at, at least uh, uh, what we see here is a um, palace of culture, the place where community cultural life was happening before 2014, and it was uh, already dest being destroyed um, by Russian artillery bombing fire. Uh, rocket uh, during these first stages of the war. And uh, as, I, uh, as I knew from the conversations with people of, of the city, um, it, it is a very important uh, place because, of course, um, in, in the frames of Soviet architecture and prevented Soviet type of um, representing a culture, um, design practically in the frames of Soviet design, different new transformations of, of city life, ideas, uh, self organized collectives were, were taking actions. And uh, it's actually a big question what design um, is doing to the cultural pro process? Should it be changed or prevented, uh, or can it be decided by? some official narrative of what will happen with this framing of cultural life in Ukraine that very often remained um, post-Soviet or was connected to the Soviet history of Ukraine. Uh, this is uh, actually a house of um, the Balseva police, uh, partly destroyed. And on the picture, we see the chief of police uh, together with uh, Ukrainian human rights activist Pavel Lysansky. And this chief of police was killed, brutally killed, um, during the fight for Dibalseva in 2015. He stayed in the city till the last moment. Um, of, of, of the fight uh, because he couldn't leave practically his people in the police and in the town. He was very much deeply connected to the people, to the community of Dibalseva. And um, when I was preparing the speech, I knew that this person has nothing to do with our conversation actually, but it was um, maybe a way for me to remember that he existed. And, uh, and represented completely different than you for Ukraine at that time connection between police, militia, post militia, and local community uh, when, when he was practically working together with people, uh, creating the system of pr protection and life saving in the situation of constant Russian attacks. Um, well, this project consists of um installations practically it it is the, the result of this project is not a photography series itself but the ways of representing it i'm showing only one picture of re representation it was an exhibition created with tatiana kachubinska and an ukrainian architect ivan minichuk we we developed um a show in national shevchenko museum uh and our collective goal was actually, it, it happened in 2016, and um, our collective goal was to, to raise awareness to this, um, to this completely different uh, environments of the working environments, context in the Eastern Ukraine that slowly seemed to be, to get out of vision of very fast, intensively changing cultural narrative in Kyiv. Uh, that was connected to Maidan and to understanding of, um, of re rethinking, the collective rethinking of the Soviet past, uh, inspired by the revolution of dignity and inspired of new understanding of uh, what Russian regime, uh, what Soviet regime 
could, could be. And of course, um, this these changes was, were also developing in the context of uh, Russian Ukrainian war and, uh, and Russian aggression. Um, I will just show several pictures from this project, um, just random that I chose um, for our discussion. Um, I, I even don't know, don't want to comment them much because I was I was um, looking I was working together with workers mostly and. Uh, it, it was not uh, my observation of their work, but most of the pictures are the result of the discussion how the idea of work can be represented today as an answer to so Soviet narrative about minor's life uh, and dignity of a minor. Because when I started this project, uh, working in the mines in the eastern Ukraine, the very big question for people who were working and living there was what has happened with our idea about ourselves with the new shifts of the society. Because in the Soviet Union, they were living in this um, double standard reality, where on one side, they, they were representing the represented through a heroic narrative. On another side, there was a huge um, exploitation in the name of this heroic narrative of, of their practically their working life was was very much um, um, connected to, to to this self self exploitation and and just centralized exploitation. Um, yeah, connected to this hero uh, heroic representation of word just felt out of my memory. And I was looking for the way, yes, to show environment, to show actually for this this project is very much connected to pro portraits of people or to look for a portrait of um, and, and to look for, for a new an image that can be, be developed today and as a diary speak about today today's experience of working in the frames of war or in the shadow, shadow of the war and in the same time be, be something that can be shown today and I was imagining even that um, I'm not the author of these images but just at that moment it was it was actually my imagination more but I, I was thinking that I'm not really an author, but it is a collective uh, work uh, that um, um, collective idea of how work can be represented. And not only work, but also a place where this work is happening. It's, um, it's a, uh, this is actually, of course, um, a, a memorial from Lysychansk. I, I don't know if it is destroyed right now. What is with it right now? Um, not only, um, yes, yeah, the work itself, but also what will happen uh, with the um, environment, working environment that itself, it, of course, as a frame of life, is also representing actually in, in today Ukrainian in the in the idea of decolonization in, in this discourse it is representing some kind of colonial uh col colonial way of of creating a space uh yes this is um this photograph was taken in Mirna, in Mirnagrad in Dmitriev in uh, 2015, and it was a, connected. Uh, th this image was uh, for me connected to Ukrainian process of decommunization, and um, it, it was um, self-organized. I think this image could fit in Mikhail's. Um, speech because it is a self-organized re rewriting what this monument could be about yes what is Lenin standing for he is for uh, destroying the city he is 
work is for peace. In, in this kind, it is an answer of the idea that it, that all representations of Soviet past are working for Russia, supporting Russian aggression against Ukraine. It was like a counter thesis de developed by somebody who, who just wrote it on, on um, the element of the monument. Um, yes, another level of question, questions is also what will we do if we will uh, really decide that all Soviet um, monuments or even spaces, yes, uh, are a representation of some um, alien uh, colonial power. What will we do with um, monuments and spaces in between that were created in the Soviet Union in the times of Soviet Union uh, that were um, infected with this aesthetics, but still are fitting some kind of Ukrainian patriotic or nationalist narrative, like um, this element that um, are coming from Lysychansk area, actually. It's another level of asking questions. Um, it's, um, we are again in Lysychansk, and uh, it's just uh, some images that I found in my archive that may be worth thinking about. What would happen if Ivor hasn't destroyed this wall? What would happen with it when we, when Ukraine will control the city again? It's um, it just this um, slogan, communism. At the elect I, I can't remember, but it's electrification of the I think something like that. I can't remember. And another level of my interest was I, I really only started working on that was small museums in some of the mines. This, that were created in the also in the Soviet past and are unique places that um, represent a museum created by workers and um, developed by workers and ex expanded even during the independence time. If this museum on the in the mine, mine miners museum wasn't closed in the first maybe decade of Ukrainian independence, like most of most such places, uh, it is still there. And uh, in, in maybe I have uh, actually found only one in um, Novodruzhevsk, but I think that uh, it's possible to, it's possible that lots of such places existed. And of course, this kind of museums um, that that include, I think, very interesting archive material about um, working culture and and of also Soviet past um, of the city and and uh, understanding what work is and what it could be, uh, also ideological history of the Soviet Union um, and, and how this understanding of 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 this um, uh, past was changing uh, without any ideological um, pressure from Kiev or from other centers, how it was changing by itself through com communities that were just deciding because this museum wasn't controlled by any minister of culture. So community of the mind could decide what they will put away. And I have discovered that they not like put things away from the museums. They sometimes would add something like an icon, orthodox icon, of course, or, or something else, but they would mm, prefer not to take some images. Um, I, I think if, if there would be a proposition, inspiration to rewrite descriptions, to images of those museums. I think workers would be really happy just to recreate those museums using complete freedom uh, and absence of self-censorship. 
that would be great uh, and this room is uh okay it's it's again the rest of the past working culture this room is a room of an artist working in a mine again in Lysychansk region and it was only one actually on on something that I have seen only once and uh I, I suppose this the, the idea that artists were invited to work to live practice practically near the mines and to work in them in, and have the studios on the territory of the mine this uh, this concept was, was developed in and started in in this area in the late soviet union times but it was a unique case in in my research practice but i think we could find some other cases like that when artists could still have his atelier on the territory of the mine and was sometimes drawing paintings for the miners museum uh, here are again pictures of environment that i of the mind that for me they look like a museum and something worth saving um i think uh, uh, just one more word that the fog fog was for me the central idea of this project because um in the situation of war and um clash of different narratives coming from outside describing the reality of Donbas. I think a lot of people felt that they lo are losing orientation and 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 they feel that they can see and analyze was um, getting more and more smaller and smaller from each month, each week. And um, I thought it was like a feeling and the fog when you can see only part of your way. And another part of the series, it's only six images that are left, um, was created in Novolinsk. It's a Western Ukrainian city um, built after the 1950s uh, around a new developed mining region in the Western Ukraine. And uh, actually, we can find in the city something that is very close uh, to, to the workers' culture. In the eastern Ukraine, again, environment, I think, and worth saving or at least worth thinking about how we could save or protect it. Uh, most of the mines... Um, it's like again on the territory of the mine mine uh number uh one uh in the city of Novolinsk that was in the process of getting closed and and destroyed and i i just uh, photographed workers that were that uh, were taking a break during uh, in in this period and uh Yes, and th this is something like uh, a cultural palace that started to be built at the end of the 80s and, have ne and, and was never finished. Yes, and now to my uh, just proposal uh, to see uh, decolonization as decentration, uh, to understand maybe... Um, to, to acknowledge, to remember that uh, one of the quality of Soviet Union was uh, was connected to creation of some narrative, propagandistic, ideological narrative that uh, that um, provoked self censorship and should spread through the whole territory of Soviet empire. And maybe the answer on, on this way of thinking about their culture would be a term connected to child psychology, disintegration. Uh, it is a term developed by Jean Piaget and um, it's yeah a stage in cognitive development uh, when a child uh, enables to look at the same object at the same time 
from different points of views. To see in a one moment, in one monument, a representation of totalitarian past, but also to see in this monument some idea of the local community, and also at the same time to see that this monument was built by the local architects, and maybe therefore it is worth saving. And to see that at the same time, we should speak about this past critically. So um, maybe that uh, term of this, this idea of, uh, of just personal development could be a key to a new cultural politics in Ukraine, supporting local communities and supporting local views without this pressure from the center that is actually, I, I have a feeling, still taking place. This idea that some mega big new narrative can be created and supported by all small cities and parts of, of a big country. And I, I think that maybe a different approach would be a real decolonization. Thank you very much. Evgenia, thank you very much. And I really think there is very much in common what Misha mentioned and you. And also in the last slide, like the state of internal contradiction, I, I think it's something that contemporary art is always doing or has the potential to do. And I think it will be also a question for uh, the discussion in the end, because as Misha mentioned about this multiplicity of meanings, of different meanings that uh, different uh, memorials can provoke and can have. And what you're also saying about this ability to concentrate on different aspects of one object, but it will be probably a general question how in contemporary reality, which is really affected and people are very much affected emotionally, how in this situation try to keep respect towards all of these different meanings and how they can co-function in a shared space, but probably it's something that we can um, discuss uh, afterwards. And uh, I would like to give a word to Nikita. I hope he is here as because we are two now in Kiev and I'm lucky now. And yeah, he's also lucky with electricity. So I'm giving the word to Nikita who will be talking on these topics also from the artistic perspective. Hello. Uh, yes, thank you for inviting me. Uh, yeah, I uh, promised to tell about uh, some uh, works of mine which uh, more or less relate uh, to the topic of Soviet uh, heritage, current relations with Soviet heritage, like during the war and uh, some uh, paradoxes of uh, commemorative politics of of the past and uh, of present. Uh, oh, yeah, maybe I'll uh, show some works of mine, uh, starting uh, with a work called uh, "The Red Mountains." And uh, yeah, yeah, please let me know when uh, when it will be on view. Yeah, Masha did it. Uh, okay, uh, so so you see it now. Uh, so uh, this is an installation of three uh, concrete objects. Each of them is a copy of uh, the pedestal. Pedestals of three monuments made by Ukrainian modernist sculptor Ivan Kavalerice, Actually, he was a filmmaker as well and a really important figure of Ukrainian uh, 
20th century culture of avant-garde period of uh, uh, World War II and post-war time period uh, of 60s. Uh, but in 20s, in second half of 20s, he created three monuments. One to uh, Artem, to communist workers leader from Donbass, the monument created in the city of Bakhmut, this uh, pedestal which is uh, in the center. Other one is a monument to Artem in the place which uh, is called uh, Sviatohirsk now, like uh, Svetigore, like Holy Mountains. But uh, in that period, for quite a short time, it was called uh, the Red Mountains, Czerwone Gore. And uh, it is the title of the work, the Red Mountains. Uh, this pedestal is uh, on the right, and the uh, pedestal on the left is uh, of the monument to Taras Shevchenko. And uh, this monument was created by Kovalerice in the same years, like everything is between uh, 1925 and 1927. So monument to Shevchenko was created in uh, Poltava. And uh, there are three different like, stories of these monuments. Monument in Bakhmut was uh, destroyed, it was exploded during uh, German occupation in 1942. just as a communist symbol. The monument in uh, Svetogirsk exists till now, even really hardly damaged. And uh, now it's like uh, in, the, in the zone of very intense fights. And Bakhmut is one of those cities of Ukraine East, which are almost destroyed already. So the monument in Svetogirsk is uh, still there. Uh, it's much damaged. And uh, on the last photo I have seen there, there was a huge Ukrainian flag attached to it. But uh, territory is just below the monument because it stands on the mountain. Uh, they were con controlled by Russians. And uh, there is an Orthodox monastery, which uh, was so much damaged, almost destroyed by Russian missiles during the fights. Uh, but in 2017, Ukrainian uh, Vice Prime Minister Vyacheslav Pelenka and uh, former director of Ukrainian Institute of National Memory Volodymyr Vyatrovich demanded to, uh, shall I not to destroy, but to stop the restoration of the monument as a road to the Bolshevik terrorist and separatist. Uh, actually, uh, they plan to use certain contradiction between the status of this monument as Ukrainian cultural heritage, because uh, one of the main examples of uh, like modernist sculpture in Ukrainian art 
Kovalyridze is one of key figures of Ukrainian avant-garde. And uh, it's almost only this geometric modernist sculpture which remained in public space after 1920s. Almost all monuments of such type, including other works by Kovalyridze, they were destroyed in Stalinist time, not because of communist content, but because of uh, like modernist style. And uh, so uh, Artem is uh, like a very important example of a uh, certain tendency in Ukrainian art. On the other hand, it's a communist monument, so there was a contradiction between uh, decommunization law and law about protection of cultural heritage. And uh, Kirilenko and Vietrovich, they wanted to use uh, these, uh, say, natural processes of destruction of concrete statue from 1927 to uh, have this contradiction like solved by itself. Uh, but it didn't happen. And uh, I really hope this monument uh, will survive. And monument to Shevchenko is still on its place, but uh, there were plans to destroy it actually twice. One dur during German occupation, and it was like anecdotic story. They thought that it was Lenin. Uh, just uh, there was a uh, moustache and uh, like uh, a bald head, uh, but no, no beard. And uh, uh, they confused two historical figures. And uh, in post-war period, uh, like local authorities just demanded to remake the face by Shevchenko because there was this Kubo futurist figure with uh, some geometric like stylization and uh, like the construction of this like academic realist form. And uh, in Stalinist times, they demanded just to change his face. So now it's Shevchenko with this uh, like Kubo Futurist geometric body and uh, like realist, even a bit like a primitive realist. Uh, like norm sculptures. Uh, oh, there are um, stories behind which uh, can tell a lot about the uh, fate of uh, the monuments in uh, different periods of Ukrainian history. And uh, also, somehow, it's important that uh, these monuments relate to the same period in their own origin, but uh, have very different legacy in a changing political context. Yeah, also I wanted to show uh, uh, the work called uh, The Tiger Sleep. Yes, yeah, the second link, uh, the second link from the top. Or I send it as a separate link. Yep, thank you. Here it is. So uh, there are several spares in different versions of the work. There are two, or there are three, or there are five. And uh, these are the copies of uh, the spares made by workers from Gorlovka in 1905 during Gorlovka armed uprising, which was a part of 1905 revolution in Russian Empire. Gorlovka is occupied by uh, Russians since 2014. I found uh, the spares 
in the storage of National Museum of History of Ukraine when I realized the work, uh, quote, the possessed can testify in court during her uh, Biennale School of Kiev in 2015, maybe. I hope I'll have a few minutes to tell about this work as well. And uh, I found these pairs made from workers' instruments. When uh, workers from factory owned by Belgian called Loest, when they started to protest, like demanding a better work, working conditions and like salaries, uh, like and it was start of this uh, real workers' movement in Donbass, uh, the factory owner called the, the police, actually, he called the Cossacks, which uh, served as a riot police in the uh, late Russian Empire. And uh, lots of workers were killed by Cossacks, others were injured. Actually, in Gorovka, there is still a monument, like a small obelisk standing uh, just uh, on the side of the street, not even on the square, just on the side of a regular street, like an obelisk of less than human height with uh, inscription. At this place, like uh, Tsarist Cossacks, they cut out the hand of worker Ivanov, which was buried after that, together with the body of the worker Kuznetsov. And it's like a local, like a local thing called like a monument to a hand. Uh, so after this brutal attack of Cossacks, workers went to, to the factory and they made weapons from their working instruments. And look at the handles of these spares. Uh, these are the handles of industrial tools. Uh, those spares which I found in a museum of Ukrainian history were not the original spares. They were reconstructions made according to the like stories, to narration by uh, former participants of uprising and these replicas were made in cities so these uh, like uh, former like workers from Gorlovka they were elderly people then uh, so it's like a reconstruction of a reconstruction or a copy of reconstruction but these pairs in museum they were not planned to be exhibited they were in the very depths of the storage and those uh, like people from museum team with whom I worked, with whom I like talked about like uh, what can be done in this museum because they invited me to some transformation of museum display as well. And they told that no, these spares are not planned to be exhibited. It relates to some like socialist workers movement and it's so not, uh, not up to date. We should speak about uh, national struggle now and uh, uh, all this worker struggle it was like overrepresented in soviet time and yeah it was but many things uh, took place and we have to concentrate on national struggle so these pairs they were like uh, you know like orphans like unwanted children of this museum narration like they had no chance chance to to be seen and uh, I made uh, these uh, copies of them and I called this work, uh, I gave a title, of, which is a quote from uh, Walter Benjamin, uh, like about tiger's leap to history, like uh, actually about what, uh, what do we take from history? Like when uh, uh, French Republic, uh, like returned to fashion, 
like started to wear again uh, some like uh, toga from uh, Roman Republican time. Like uh, according to Benjamin, it was like a tiger sleep to the past. But uh, in the field of fashion, it's this tiger sleep, like uh, engine, like uh, on arena of the circus, under the supervision of the ruling class, and the same leap, same jump, under the open skies of history, is called revolution. Oh, yeah, and please show the work uh, uh, that possessed can testify in court. Одержимый может свидетельствовать в суде. Yep, this one. Yeah, actually, I found spares when I worked on this project in uh, Museum of Ukrainian History, and uh, you see some uh, like metal shelves, and uh, there are some objects which I found in museum storages. And actually, uh, one spare is, uh, is one of them. You see there is a spare on, uh, on the right. And uh, also uh, there are a few like little artworks of mine, which I added rather as a, as a comment. And all these objects were found in uh, the depths of the storage they mainly related to the Soviet history of Donbass and of Crimea, and they were not planned to be represented. These all are like, uh, like orphans of museum narration. So like uh, not loved, like unwanted children, like including uh, the original sketch to Artyom by Ivan Kavalerice and also two sculptures related to like revolutionary movement on Donbass and to Soviet Donbass. And uh, for example, model of a uh, residential building, like uh, which was built by uh, German uh, military prisoners after the end of World War II in Donbass, or two decorative glass vitrines which uh, were made as gifts to Soviet officials from some Crimean uh, like uh, trade union, like workers organizations. And uh, the compositions inside show some very idealized images of Soviet Crimea as some like uh, subtropical called Paradise. And on the one, uh, there is interesting inscription, actually, yeah, on this one. Like, uh, like from the workers of Crimean region to mother Ukraine on her, yeah, to the native Ukraine for her 40th anniversary. So, you know, when uh, Crimea became the part of Soviet Ukraine, but uh, this object is uh, from like early 60s, from 60s. So, see, uh, like uh, the birth of uh, Soviet Ukraine, uh, of, like of USSR. Mm, uh, and uh, here is some contradiction, some paradox. And uh, the arrangement of this object, it was like a, you know, like a poem made not of the words, like of phrases, it was, it was made uh, of material objects, but they were arranged like uh, really in, in a poetic way. And my own words from the Sarah's observation on archives 
where archival images were partly covered by black charcoal. They served as comments. Yeah, maybe I would like to show the last work called uh, the project with postponed implementation. I've sent it uh, in a very last letter. There were three images. It is a very recent work. I realized it uh, for the show in a museum called MSL in uh, Lutz in Poland. And it was installed uh, in the place which is very well known, like in uh, Western art history, an abstract cabinet from Hanover, constructed by Lisitsky. Uh, and uh, this cabinet uh, was uh, invented exactly for showing abstract art. And you see some paintings by Vladislav Szyminski hanging there. But also I added one object, this golden sphere on a red cube. It is a, also a reconstruction quote of the public sculpture which never emerged in public. It existed only as a sketch. It was a pro project of monument to the president of planet Earth. So monument to Vladimir Hlebnikov, to, to Russian futurist poet. And author of uh, the project of the monument was Vasil Yermilov, Ukrainian avant-garde artist, like uh, maybe leader of constructivist artistic movement in uh, Soviet Kharkiv. Uh, Hlebnikov spent Sometime in Kharkiv twice. First time he uh, was like escaping uh, like record to Russian army during World War I. And he spent this time in a psychiatric hospital in Kharkiv. And for second time, uh, he uh, was already like um, in 1919, uh, when uh, it was a strong avant-garde artistic movement. And actually then he became a president of planet Earth. It was a part of um, a performance on the stage of uh, Kharkiv uh, Municipal Theater. After Hlebnikov's death, Vasil Yermilov, who knew Hlebnikov, like Yermilov was a very young person when he met Hlebnikov, and he was very much under his influence. Actually, he turned to like, avant-garde artists from, he was uh, more of, uh, you know, like uh, modern art deco, secession artist before, and uh, after meeting with Hlebnikov and other futurists, he uh, turned to much more like uh, radical positive art. And after Klebnikov's death, Yermilov made a project of this monument. It never was realized. And now I invited people who work with VR animation to, I, I would ask you to show next two images. So together with them, we made like a project proposal, like imagine for some public competition like uh, to really like erect this monument in Kharkiv in between of ruins, just it's a monument surrounded by rubble after the Russian shelling. The monument to great Russian poet, very much connected with history of Kharkiv, but in the city partly ruined by Russian missiles and actually city hardly suffering from Russian shelling just now. Yeah, so this work was exhibited as a sort of like proposal in a Polish museum. 
I uh, haven't uh, exhibited it in Ukraine, and you can imagine it's not so easy to make any, any sort of exhibition in Ukraine now. But uh, I have a feeling that uh, such project uh, could be like sort of a uh, trigger and uh, it can uh, provoke a scandalous effect and uh, quite aggressive reaction but i didn't test i have to test it at least uh, in my instagram uh, yeah, but I see a uh, certain uh, like important important paradox here about uh, how we will deal with our history, including like history of culture, history of art during ongoing war in next years and after the end of the war, as we are used to say, after Ukrainian victory. Uh, and, uh, you know, when uh, um, we look at uh, this monument, uh, monuments to, for example, to Alexander Pushkin, uh, uh, which are removed or covered now. Like, um, yeah, we, we understand this, these monuments, they emerged as certain uh, colonial symbols that uh, they are not about like 19th century romantic poet from Eastern Europe, that uh, they are monuments to like Pushkin, not to Petefe or Mitskevich uh, for very obvious reasons. And uh, when uh, we hear very actually popular slogans that there is, there is no Russian cult culture without Russian text, yeah? or that uh, each Dostoevsky is uh, followed by Russian missiles. Yeah, I hear certain, uh, certain truths here, but if we will replace uh, like name uh, Dostoevsky with names like Platonov or Shalamov, it will sound quite weird. And uh, like maybe to end uh, with, I don't believe into any like homogeneous national culture, including Russian one. There are different Russian cultures and different Ukrainian cultures as well. And uh, now we, um, We can afford certain uh, like technical seeking, uh, like which relates to cultural boycotts. When we'll be able to switch to more strategic thinking, we'll face lots of paradoxes, which we create uh, just now with our hands. Um, yeah, it's not uh, just premonition. It it will be. We'll have to answer new questions then. Thank you. Thank you, Nikita, and thank you for sharing the last project, which is like really vulnerable. And I think it's there are also many contradictions in itself. Uh, and uh, I would like to give a word to the last contributor uh, to Valentina's Klimaschauskas. And uh, I hope we will have also some time left for a discussion. So please.
Uh, hello. I hope you can hear me. In case you don't hear me, I guess you will tell me, but you are not hearing me well. Uh, thanks for this chance to be here and to listen to really interesting, deep, and also problematic, because the topic is very problematic, uh, talks. Uh, my presentation is going to be short. It's titled Decolonizing Your Mouth, Brutal Poetics of Disinformation. Uh, <laughs> just now realized that I just been to a dentist. So in a way, my small presentation is about that also. And um, I've got all kind of painkillers. So um, I am a bit dizzy at this moment. So if I see something funny, uh, yeah, <laughs> take it as it is. Uh, yeah, I'm coming from Vilnius. I'm a curator and writer. So this is why I guess also for me, it's very interesting and important to understand the language, how we use it, especially when you think about language or many languages in Central and Eastern Europe and the very problematic relationship between the languages we use normally and also the English language. And of course, the relation to the language, the Russian language, which used to be the main language, at least in the region I'm coming from, and I'm pretty sure you have even more close uh, uh, connection to that language. So the idea of decolonizing your mouth, uh, uh, especially talking to artists, because I'm a curator, and using it as a writer, it's something I do quite often. So uh, my small abstract would be something like uh, this. While the art world well, has, uh, when you talk about now, right, quite many, I guess, uh, newsletters and invitations exhibitions, we mention the same uh, reference to ongoing multiple crisis. So while the art world has for some time already been talking about the urgency to create new visions and vocabularies uh, for non-discriminative and all-inclusive worlds, well, it's some kind of utopia, but still, in the current climate of ecological and other disasters, colonial and imperial thinking is expanding its own brutal chauvinistic and retrograde regimes. So let's analyze a few aspects of the brutal politics of disinformation that accompany or accompanies Russia's military intervention in Ukraine. Uh, I'm using uh, uh, some visual materials I found on Twitter coming from different sites. This one is coming from uh, some, I guess, Russian, pro-Russian, pro-war person. As you know, a couple of Latin letters like VZ were widely used uh, uh, during the first day and before of invasion. Um, I mean, invasion of this year. And uh, in some countries, like in Baltic countries and in some other countries, those two letters were banned as symbols, as pro-war symbols. So some internet troll, uh, I think it's a Photoshop, they made the whole Latin alphabet. Uh, on some Russian army cars, which obviously would make some problems if all those letters were, would be banned. So it just stayed as some kind of bad trolling joke. Uh, so let's go back to uh, the ideology, uh, uh, to the Russian propaganda to set a methodology what they're actually using or how they use language in information sphere and in social media sphere. Because also of, although the topic is um, Russian soldier, Russian soldier, especially I guess in writing now, it's more or less sounds like uh, some kind of uh, a metaphor, a trope, especially in a space of contemporary media. Uh, maybe monuments, maybe more or less in our region I'm coming from, they're not that visible anymore because they've been removed in the 90s. 
but we still have uh, uh, some monuments to Soviet soldiers and something similar uh, uh, in a bit further cemeteries. Uh, and we have a few of ongoing cases um, that are dealing with uh, what should be done with those sculptures. Well, I'm, 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 I'm kind of also interested in how uh, and the trope of a Soviet soldier, let's say, or Russian military in general is being used. So uh, what they actually do, the, the really most important thing for them is trying to construct some alternative realities. So in March 22, the right and regional expert Peter Pomerantsev, who has extensively written on how Russia is using the media as an extension of its military power, tweeted a popular joke in Moscow pro Putin circles. Two Russian soldiers are drinking champagne in Russian-occupied Paris. The whole of Europe is conquered. I live in Paris now, so it's a uh, it's, uh, relevant joke for me, to me. <laughs> Did you hear one smiles to the ever? We lost the information war. So let's not forget that this joke is just a joke, but also it is not, right? We shouldn't be naive in regarding its imperialistic fantasy and how easily and with a typical Russian bravado, it transforms what at that moment seemed to be the failure of Russian propaganda into an imaginary military victory. In this way, way uh, the joke is propaganda par excellence, as it camouflages itself a silly gag, while at the same time it continues and expands the Russian propaganda machinery. It uses a popular format of a joke, something we all seemingly enjoy and do not instantly su suspect the copyright of Russian psychological warfare agency to be behind. So to continue, it reinterprets the status of information war. Suddenly a failure appears to be a victory. It finally fulfills the bad pun intended Putinist dream about Russia from one ocean to another, from Lisbon to Vladivostok. The only thing you, the subject of this disinformation, must do is relax, stop being critical, and support Putin and the troops by becoming just another dis disciplined body brick in the building of the zombified society. This body brick thing uh, uh, was really popular in March. You could see various formations of Russian people doing it, uh, being told or volunteer, it's difficult to say. And as Russia's military invasion of Ukraine in February 2022 was preceded and informed by vast massive disinformation campaigns of psychological warfare, we started seeing military machines with the letter Z, V, and O moving into Ukraine. Uh, as we saw on some memes and photos I showed before. Over the course of a week or so, various propaganda media campaigns included the letters that started mushrooming through Russia on t-shirts, headbands, cars, and buildings to support the special military operation, as the Russian government officially called it. What's really important in this kind of situation for this kind of propaganda is to present uh, um, propaganda as it's not propaganda, as it was kind of made or thought naturally by a so-called a generally politically engaged person. Uh, to connect to the Russian soldier, to the Soviet soldier, they always kind of being presented also as some kind of natural people loving savers, just the kind of natural Russian Soviet soldier just saving the world, saving cats, saving children, church, save, saving all people. So this idea of generally political engaged person is also very important to kind of debunk and try to see who's behind that. Yeah. Who are this person? Are they generally politically engaged persons? So you have most probably heard about troll factories, obviously, that are spreading Russian pro war li lies online. One of the trolls' tasks is to make this kind of propaganda look as if a generally political engaged person created it so the post, as the joke, seems a natural continuation of what the people want. 
And one could say that the troll's main task is to give what they write a human touch. Write it so there seems to be a genuine politically engaged person sitting at the screen. For example, I was told at the start that I should write something like, I was in my kitchen baking, and I was thinking how Putin is doing a really good job. You might write from a fake profile as an ordinary woman that I would like to meet a good man, someone like Sergei Shoigu, and then mention how great it is uh, that he just ordered a new fighter planes. I quote here uh, Ludmila Savchuk, which around 2015, she was a journalist and she went undercover to expose the Russian troll factory in St. Petersburg. However, now uh, there are researchers that, especially since March, uh, uh, for example, in, in Guardian, uh, the British newspaper, they did this research also that uh, uh, Russian trolls, they work also from Asia and Africa. Active measures, that's how they call it actually. Uh, the Russian name for it is Aktivnaya Meropriatia or active measures. So, in this context, it is vital to understand the definition of psychological warfare or psi war. It depends on which country and which uh, cell uh, is using that, that, that keyword, which has been known by many other names or terms, including psyops political warfare, hearts and minds, and propaganda, or also disinformation campaigns. The war describes any action practiced mainly by psychological methods to evoke a planned psychological reaction in other people and is supported by such military, economic, or political measures as may be required. And as one of the leading specialists on Russian uh, military strategy in the world, he's Latvian, Yanis Bergens. So he focuses on uh, just extraposition of the hybrid and conventional aspects of warfare, such as influence, information, and psychological operations. According to him, the Russian view of modern warfare is based on the idea that the, and this is actually, I guess, the most important thing, the main battle space is the mind and as a result, new generation wars are to be dominated by information and psychological warfare, morally and psychologically depressing the enemy's armed forces, personnel, and civil population. The main objective is to reduce the necessity for deploying hard military power to the minimum necessary. Although it actually doesn't really work now in Ukraine. They are using whatever military power we have. And Operation Control Z. Uh, which is uh, uh, created by Ukrainian, uh, you know, internet war warriors, I guess. And will we be able to zombify this kind of alphabet, alphabet and the brain? There is no easy answer, and let's not pretend we have one. As we want, this formation is continuing and uh, uh, is intensified, and is looking for new. Uh, uh, plans for new medias, for new technologies, how to do it. However, they need to denazify and dezombify the minds and alphabet remains origin, of course. Since the letter Z, which doesn't exist in the Russian alphabet, became a symbol of a pro-war stance in Russia, and because Russian media and social media accounts that stand for the invasion often put Z in their names or logos, a few EU countries banned the public display of Russian military symbols from the letter Z and V. And Russian social media trolls started by making new memes suggesting that banning the alphabet is not the way to go since countries using Latin will have to ban the whole Latin alphabet, as I showed before in that image. Um, and a couple of years before the war, I chatted with Marcos Lechens, an artist and hypnotist. Maybe you know him. Uh, about the need to create a new language and go to pre-language states, among other things. So according to him, because he's a, a hypnotist, as I said, according to him, before language even starts to express itself, itself, the opportunity of experimenting in the mental areas before verbal communication presents us with the possibility of understanding things in very different ways, perhaps more fundamental ways 
uh, conversely more unexplored ways. It seems that people will need to find a safe place to seek their agency and cut loose from the needle of disinformation. And Marcos described the ultimate place of the shelter being perhaps in the cavity or cave over your mouth, out of which a weaving together of words may emanate to create an imaginary dwelling. And with all the disinformation around us, we must explore entirely new ways of thinking, he continued. Words, ideas, and actions alone, using all thought patterns, will not be enough. Following Marcos' thoughts, Operation Control Z will most probably take place by decolonizing psychological warfare and one's imagination by giving back the agency to the people to create new realities and vocabularies that are non-discriminative and generate all-inclusive worlds. Whatever it means, it's uh, difficult, I guess, maybe impossible aim and goal. It's still um, an interesting trajectory. And with certain skepticism to a vast amount of ideological content, it seems that people are fighting back the disinformation with creative articulations, symbols, and memes more actively than ever before. And I actually see artists doing that more and more also successfully. And they actually become yeah, very instrumental in this ongoing uh, war of disinformation. However, of course, the main battles, as always, are still waiting in the near present. That's a famous me meme, and I guess most, one of the most, most successful memes I've seen about the war in uh, Ukraine. Uh, yep. Yeah. So I stop sharing. Mm -hmm. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. And thank you all for all of the contributions. Uh, now I think we have like less time than it was estimated. But also right now, I would like to uh, join uh, Dorin Mender as well, who is the head of the research department uh, of the Staatliche Kunstsammlung in Dresden, and who was making also a research project on decolonizing socialism. So like she, uh, we're lucky you are here with us to be here as a respondent. And also, I know that there are some viewers that we have right now on YouTube. So I just want to say that you're also welcome to put questions if you have some. And uh, I think what is a comment that all of you shared, and I think we all shared, like uh, everyone is talking about this multiplicity of um, different mean different meanings uh contradictions like as nikita mentioned this contradictions which are inside the monument how to deal with the monument how to deal with the heritage so we cannot make a very simplified only one way of thinking about the past and the heritage and the histories because every experience or even the attitude to the monument is very much individualized and so question would be how it is possible in contemporary realia, how we can, and what also Valentina's mentioned about creating a language. And I think that the question of language is really important and very interesting today, because I think that everyone, especially in Ukraine, experienced when the war started, this uh, impossibility of using any type of language and which tools to find to describe the situation. But now, despite that we are still in the situation of the war, uh, it's important probably to create this um, complex language, as you, Valentina, also suggested, like somehow to go to this prayer um, language condition. But how, uh, when we are being so much also affected and by the war and the um, uh, conflict and different type of power structures, how we can create a complex narrative. First of all, what, what does it give to us, how it informs our future and what values can it bring? But at the same time, how we can keep all these complexities and keep uh, respect towards each individualized voice who are at the same time very much contradictory to each other, like as Nikita also mentioned within the 
thinking about the communist past, but understanding that, like, for example, uh, Ivan Kavaleridze, uh, who is a very important figure uh, in Ukrainian modernism, uh, how we can build these complex narratives, but uh, at the same time trying to keep respect towards these multiple voices who are contradictory, but at the same time, how we can enable them speak in a shared space. It's like general question to uh, everyone who wants to start. You can. Uh, yeah, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, yeah, it's a tough question. And um, I think we've heard some proposals, how to maybe start and how, how to continue. And I guess it's happening uh, kind of naturally. Um, I think uh, what Misha Gobovich said, and I think also what Nikita said, that it's very important to invite as many possible uh, parties who are behind the monuments, who, uh, who have some connection to the monuments, uh, uh, which is also very problematic. And sometimes I guess we'll need time uh, to get various narratives coming from different sides and kind of just try to keep uh, as horizontal the system as possible uh, and trying to listen. And obviously that the war brought back all traumas and created new tragedies and traumas that will not be easy uh, uh, forgotten. And we will really have to also somehow be translated into the new narratives. And the process is going to be as long and, and painful and some kind of therapy will be needed, you know, in terms of language and listening and listening. I mean, by language, I mean, uh, in the most maybe like wide, wider sense, like the language of materials, the language of anything, not just what may be articulated, but also what is still needs to find its own articulation. So maybe pre-language, yeah. <laughs> We will stop here. If anyone wants to uh, to continue and like I, I mean just a general question to uh, all of you if anybody wants to to share the thoughts about this. I mean you can just unmute and yeah or raise a hand there is also a possibility to raise a hand. Can you see my hand? I didn't want to cut off Doreen if she wanted to say something. No? But just uh, one more um, thought to complicate things even further. Um, because I think that you asked this question about what do we do in order to take all these different narratives on board? And once again, we're back to the question of narratives. But the problem is that with what's happening now, it's not just an issue of narrative. So let's look at the specific example of the Mykolaiv monument that was blown up. A few days before the explosion, there was actually a conflict on site at the monument where one group of you know, radical, let's say enemies of the monument wanted to, to basically take it down. And another group of people who were connected to the police tried to defend it and said, um, you know, you have to understand, we are not being unpatriotic, we are not being Soviet, but for us, this is deeply meaningful because it was actually erected, you know, as part of a sort of grassroots initiative. It commemorates people who died in the line of duty, etc. And then, you know, that didn't lead to anything. And a few days later, overnight, it was blown up. So the thing is that it's not just a question of finding the right narratives because radical iconoclasts will not wait for the narrative to change or for the symbolic landscape to change. They will just come in and destroy monuments that they don't like, which can lead to a whole sort of spiral of you know, violence and counter-violence. So I think it's not just a question of narratives, it's also a question of some sort of institutional arrangement that will you know, allow these things to happen in let's say a more dialogical way. And of course, I think it would be illusory to expect in a context, in a context like Ukraine's today, when the country obviously has far more significant problems to, you know, for, for the state to devote significant resources to this. 
So I don't have a solution. I just want to point out that it's really, really difficult to find one. I would like also to add, I think it's also important what you mentioned with this monument because there were two opposite groups. Uh, but at the same time, as far as I remember, there was also um, a representative of some uh, local branch of uh, some cultural institution who is protecting their the heritage. And it was said that this monument is under the protection of the state, so it's not possible. So, I mean, it's also a third party. And I think that it's important point what you're saying about like, yes, of course, it's not about building a right narrative. And, uh, um, and then it will be a question like, what we as cultural practitioner artists curators can do also in this perspective. So it turns out to be that we can be here, for example, in a Zoom or in, or in another part, type of discussion. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's like, it's something that we can acknowledge in a way, um, like in, in capacity to act, or probably we would need um, some time to reflect upon this. But Dorin is, I would like to mention something and to add, please. Yeah, thank you so much, Tatiana and Masha and Misha for your presentation and Yevgenia and Nikita, thank you so much for your really great presentation, Valentina. And uh, I'm, 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 I'm struggling a bit to connect all these different kind of ambitions that panel would like to tackle. And uh, what I think what crystallizes for me at this moment is an, an, like a huge tension and a deep, I mean, is it even, like, can we have another word for contradiction and an impossibility to relate the question of the state in relation to the people? So what Misha has been presenting were kind of uh, monuments that I would really situate in the need of demonumentalizing those monumental articulations of state power, of a state socialist declaration in the context of modernity. And Nikita, I really appreciate very much the way how you have been reconnecting continuously your presentation and the question of also Ukraine avant-garde or Ukraine modernism in art to the question also of modernity as a political uh, project, as a profound world-making project um, that also the so-called East and the project of socialism, state socialism particularly, is implicated in. Uh, what I'm struggling with is like, how can we connect that with this question of the monument that we have been engaging here in so many different iterations already in that kind of constellation of voices of that panel. I really appreciate it a lot. Also Yevgenia's elaboration on the workers and the way how workers practices have been uh, imagining and also articulating the spaces of uh, their spaces. I mean, you connected that to the making of like, as if this is a kind of uh, workers museum uh, articulation. So what I would like to bring in into this conversation is the need to really inquire, you know, what would be a decolonial approach to those questions we and the problem and the struggle and the, the pain and the war we are in, which is uh, what uh, Aisha Bastyreva in a conference that we organized in June, an Ukrainian uh, video maker, maybe you know her, I remember, and it was the first time I was really very consciously reflecting on that, the Russian military invasion in the Ukraine, she considered a, a kind of an of an imperial war, a continuation of imperialism that we have experienced in the 20th century. And uh, we are witnessing probably the consequences and the political depression of an unresolved um, uh, failure of a political project. And it's a project also of modernity, socialism, or more precisely communism, and more precisely even there, the project of internationalism is not detachable from uh, you know, modernity as a world making 
imaginary and also that has been enacted through various social, political, economic, cultural uh, structures. So, um, I mean, uh, if we talk about the decolonial in this kind of context, I wonder whether we are already in that process. Uh, we are in the process of crystallizing narratives all the time. I think these narratives do exist already all the time. And I think uh, Nikita's presentation was really brilliant in that regard uh, to understand that moment of reflection, a continuous kind of refolding into trans-historic processes with the Walter Benjamin's proposition of the Taika's Leap, that is already a critique on the linearity of time also as a modernist principle of how do we understand and how are we taught to relate to history. And uh, the monument that Misha was presenting for me is such a modernist kind of uh, par excellence declaration of a past in its pastness, a modernity that exists through representation in the one heroic figure this is what modernity is. I mean, the modernity is defined in philosophy and as a political and as a cultural project through representation, through individualization, through the manifestation of reason, through the division of the world into the rational and the irrational, into the object, into the subject. Uh, it also is defined uh, through the division between old and new and the idea of progress. And this all we can find in the project of modernity when it comes to the political project of socialism as a state socialism. And we, we are witnessing at this time, but also let's maybe not forget that decolonization is a historic political revolutionary project in the second half of the 20th century that has been conceptualized and practiced primarily by, you know, by people. And I really would like to highlight in this presentation of four of, of all of you that you have been continuously reconnecting the political struggle to the struggle of the people. I really think this is extremely important and decolonization um, as it's been recently discussed with Adam Gitacho, world making after empire, decolonization is a long jury, a long process in history that um, like conceptualizes the idea of the national as a project of self-determination to remake an international order. So if we think of decolonization, it's a continuous oscillation between the national and you know that what is world making as an international horizon, but we consider that as an internationalism from below. And again, we come into the people. So, um, what Tatiana, what your question is, and this I think we have been finding here in, in all the presentations, is how does it resonate in the means of art and artistic kind of articulation, of curatorial articulation, of also articulations of art research, and you know how um, that uh, informs uh, you know uh, those means of making and those means of reflection. And um, I mean, um, I think what Nikita, what you have been um, presenting, I would like to understand, maybe I can ask a question for Nikita also, but maybe also to Misha and to everyone who, you know, uh, also for uh, uh, Yevgenia, that's a very important question, you know, um, but Nikita, in your, in your work, you are working with the geometric monuments, which seems to refuse the idea of, you know, uh, representation and individualization as such. And uh, you also said something really compelling that I found uh, important because, you know, what do we do after revolution? I think you said something that how do we deal with art during and after the war? Or maybe it was Tatiana or someone mentioned this kind of, you know, um, uh, need to think what happens after the revolution, what happens after the war. And uh, is like, can you maybe say a bit more, Nikita, about you know the monuments you have been working on uh, as kind of artistic material reflections and also like artistic articulations that 
uh, go, you know, um, where you reflect this kind of what you consider the tiger sleep, this falling of the, 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 the present into the past, how this shows itself in these kind of geometric monuments. How would you relate to these kind of geometric mo monuments in the context of the Ukrainian modernity that refuses forms of representation, that refuses maybe also the kind of the, 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 the cut, the division between the old and the new. Because I think you and also Yevgenia brought in, um, but also I think Valentina, you, you continuously connected that um, to like forms of practices of the people, like from um, various communities, various different communities in Ukraine, and I just really wonder how, um, you know, um, yeah, I'm not even quite sure whether I have a precise question. It's more like a commentary and a reflection. But um, would you agree, Nikita, that your work um, is indicating a different kind of modernity that allows us to think of you know the project of Ukrainian modernity in the context of communism as also a way to find forms of organization connecting different communities across the country across uh, the, the, um, the Soviet former Soviet Union if this makes sense I hope so I'm a bit rambling, I'm sorry about that, but it was really so many different kinds of avenues and so different concerns. What I also, Tatiana, really appreciate about your proposal to think of an uncomfortable past and how this, this quiet, uncomfortable past is kind of informing um, like a contemporary inquiry and uh, how this also might change our artistic and curatorial and research practices because art is also like really at stake and in question what art can do in such a condition. Nikita, will you uh, comment then on Doreen's uh, remark? Please, you're, you're muted. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't mention. Uh, yes, yeah, like a question or replica, so multi, like multi-layered, so complex that it's not so easy to answer. I try at least two two parts. You know, I thought about this Shevchenko on the photo by Evgenia in her presentation. Like uh, he's a key because. It's Shevchenko, but uh, not a key because uh, uh, it is this uh, Stalinist, like now classical socialist realism. And also it might be a uh, part of some Soviet ensemble. As you know, it's often like uh, you have Shevchenko and uh, next to him uh, you have for example, Red Army uh, soldiers or revolutionary revolutionary workers, like in Monument to Taras Shevchenko in Kharkiv. And they are part of one composition, and some parts of uh, the same ensemble are okay, according to like uh, national patriotic uh, positions, and others are wrong. But if you cut the composition, you like you destroy an ensemble, you destroy some like uh, aesthetical wholeness and purity. And uh, so it's not so obvious how to act, even if you are um, like, for example, like nationalist who, who actually demands the destruction of Soviet monuments. Even from this, like uh, quite uh, you know simple and like straightforward position, you cannot easily uh, solve this uh, this contradiction, this paradoxes. And uh, if your position is uh, more complex, um, uh, yeah, what uh, what should you do? 
uh, or when you have communist monuments, which are in time like a part of the Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian avant-garde. And as you may know, like Ukrainian avant-garde and Ukrainian modernism are so important parts of like new Ukrainian national narrative. Uh, and uh, not only because of their innovative uh, forms and contents, but also because of key figures of Ukrainian modernism and avant-garde, they were repressed, they were executed like uh, during Stalinism, actually planted of key figures of Ukrainian modern culture. They were executed like in one day in 1937 in Sandermoch. Uh, and uh, yeah, so the form is a key, the content is wrong. Or the content is a key and the form is wrong. And uh, plenty of uh, situations in between. Uh, and uh, then maybe somebody would propose like a total purifying of uh, let's say landscape of commemoration in Ukraine and making it uh, totally anew yeah uh, like uh, I am a bit scared to imagine how how it will look because uh, aesthetically newest Ukrainian uh, monuments and other forms of commemoration, including like so-called patriotic muralism. They, uh, they are quite, uh, quite awful. Uh, but uh, somebody will maybe say that the war itself helps to purify the landscape of commemoration. Like uh, imagine, uh, like remember Kirilenko and uh, Vetrovich from my story. Uh, they uh, wanted uh, this contradiction between like saving cultural heritage and destroying communist symbolics to be solved by the physical destruction of the concrete statue. Uh, so for some people, war is also like, uh, let's say cleaning the landscape in this sense and, and um, the plenty of people I know like some local authorities they like immediately come with proposals of uh, new monuments like uh, like uh, mayor of Bucha for example now I'm uh, moving from Kiev to Bucha to live for a few months and I know this story from from quite close uh, and uh, I would uh, try to give some sort of alternative propose now, like a bit of utopian one. Uh, imagine all the monuments, like all, totally, they just stop to be monuments. Like, uh, you know, like uh, we, like some new, new social consensus just takes the status of monuments from them but they remain in public space in a new status, like monuments to the monuments, like uh, some uh, museum of uh, different forms of historical commemoration from the period of modernity, for example. Like, uh, no, I imagine such sort of like a meta museum takes just plenty of public space. And uh, maybe for lots of people, it's unacceptable even for this reason. But in such a museum, monuments uh, like to Lenin from, uh, say, from 50s and monuments to like Bandera from mm -hmm. 2000s, they would have, have the same status. And uh, it could be a very different attitude, but would be like erect new monuments in such a such a world in this mm -hmm. utopia i think uh, we definitely will not make any more like a uh, figurative uh, status of uh, like uh, the bronze man with sword 
like uh, with an angel, with a candle, or on uh, just maybe new monuments should have forms of like sound sculptures or a dance or some like transformation in a landscape, some land art piece or like a poem or uh, whatever. But uh, we uh, should uh, just, uh, you know, turn this page like uh, the epoch of these forms of commemoration, which were like so, say, normal for, for the world of modernity. Maybe it should be over. It's an utopian solution. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dorin wanted to comment something, yeah, or not? Because you, no. yeah, do we have some time? I'm not sure. I think oh. we're also running out of. I just, we are like 14 minutes already beyond the time. But I, but I would, I mean, thank you, um, Nikita. But maybe this is a question for for everyone also on this panel. Uh, how do you deal with that kind of? Um, danger of na nationalization or how to relate to the question of the national in uh, that inquiry um, of, you know, through the monument. And this I think is similar for Misha, but I mean, Nikita, your proposal is, 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 is great. I mean, to turn the monument into an artifact but still, uh, this would be a demonumentalization of its kind of um, modernistic imperative. But how do you deal with that? You know, because the monument is such a like methodology also of, of um, declaration of power. And but I think the major concern for me really is the question of the national. How do we deal with that? How do we refuse a nationalization as a power structure, but rather think, you know, nations in relation, national struggles in plurality in relation to each other? And Misha wanted to add it, yeah, to add. Something. Yeah, I just wanted to react quickly to Nikita because I, I really love his ideas for, for working with monuments. And since I'm the only person here who has nothing to do with the art world, I wanted to express my, my surprise that in our part of the world, you know, in, in Central and Eastern Europe, there are so few examples of people really coming up with original artistic interventions around these monuments. I mean, there are some really, really interesting examples. We know them from Estonia, from Ukraine, other places, but you know, to, to give you an example from, from Vienna, where I live now, there's a, um, there's a very controversial monument here to uh, a, a famous or infamous anti-Semitic mayor of Vienna, Leuger, and, and people have been coming up with, with ideas for a long time. And one idea that I really love is to simply tilt the statue by 30 degrees simply to create a sort of immediate visceral feeling that something is not right. And this hasn't been implemented yet, but at least there's a, there's a really big public discussion about these things. And I, you know, as, as a complete outsider to the art world, I would love for there to be more public proposals of this kind to, you know, work with statues in public space and simply by modifying them a little bit even temporarily create this sort of feeling of estrangement that would make people adopt a different perspective uh, i think it's really interesting point uh, what you're saying but and what you're saying about this uh, tilt in the statue is also an artistic gesture but uh like when you put a little bit of estrangement, but I think it's something like you put another question, it's very much important that the communities are being involved into this decision making. And uh, it's it's really important because as we were discussing the whole, like whole our, uh, sorry for tautology discussing during the discussion, but uh, like really this question of conflicting and contradictory uh, memories or experiences or meanings 
of every situation. And in this case, when we are working with public space and monuments, which are in the public space, so automatically each resident, each citizen share this public space with each other. So it's really important to make this decision together with different communities and probably through these gestures to to make this interconnection with different communities that might be also contradicting and conflicting to each other. Um, yeah, and uh, if just uh, to continue also, like when we are talking now about this artistic gesture or you're talking from the perspective of a historian, but I think it's also important that today we have uh, really multiple um, optics on the topic. I also would like to come back to this issue or question of the role of the cultural practitioners and um, this possibility that Nikita mentioned and then Doreen uh, um, highlighted this point because the question what we do and what art we do after the war. And um, probably it's a question it's a question to everyone, but probably more specifically also to Evgenia, because I think you are also here. Uh, you are, like, as I said in the start, that you're working, uh, combining different strategies, visual arts, photography, activism, literature, but you are someone who are who is very much embedded and engaged with people when you make a pro project, any type of um, photographic project, you're very much connected to the communities and you're very much integrated. And um, how do you think like in this situation when we are, we are talking about all this nonlinear, multi-layered um, narratives that we can build and individual stories, what is the role, uh, what could be the role of artists, researchers and other cultural practitioners like right now, if there are tools that we can do anything when we are inside the war or what is it all like when we, now when it finishes with victory? Um, thank you, Tatiana. And uh, yeah, it was great to listen uh, to Nikita, to Valentina. And um, I, I think that um, in today's, uh, cultural Ukrainian cultural community, uh, lots of difficult questions like like that one is are postponed. So we are thinking, let's start to work on that after the victory or when the war would be finished. Mm. At the same time, war is creating realities, creating narratives, and uh, in the question of solidarity or helping each other we, we really think we, we really see um how community are functioning in ukraine but i don't think we can see how they are functioning when we are speaking about collective memory or dealing with cultural or soviet or historian heritage it is much more groups of power that are showing the influence or the ability to decide than communities that are deciding. Actually, as I have observed by myself, communities are very careful dealing with monuments. And uh, mostly because of the reasons um, Misha mentioned, because monuments for communities are disconnected, very often disconnected from their history, mostly, and th they are coming or th they are um, getting in the stage of a part of private bi biography or private city experience. And um, yeah, and, and therefore I, I would say what, what art could do or community could do cultural community theoretically could empower communities all over Ukraine to decide and not being afraid to be to sound or to look unpatriotic if they feel patriotic because um, the pressure and the radicalization is it's high of course 
of course, Russia is invading Ukraine and destroying human lives. And it is very hard in this situation to, to raise the question about any object that is not a human, that is not a human life, that is not a child, a, an old person that is just, just killed uh, at the place where, where where he or she is at that moment. And um, I think th one of the methods could be to connect an object to a life, to, to bring life back to an object, to describe an object as a part of these biographical lives. And destruction of the object during the war is actually, again, a destruction of a small part of, of the lives of these people who survived Russian aggression, uh, who are maybe very pro-Ukrainian, but they still want to have this part of their collective memory, maybe. But it should be discussed. We need more time. Maybe they will decide still to destroy it or to put it away, but to allow ourselves to decide slowly and to discuss, that is actually not, not something that we cannot allow ourselves. I think actually that we can allow ourselves and it will be an opposite to what is happening in the country that is attacking us nowadays. Thank you so much. And uh, also, uh, it's unfortunate, but I'm happy that we had really uh, intense contributions and the talks, but I'm sad that we really have like really four minutes left uh, for our stream. And probably like each of us can have just a really final replica, which is really, really short. If, if you like, or we can uh, just Finish. So uh, then, thank you very much for uh, for your contribution, and Doreen, thank you very much for joining us and summarizing this complex um, experience and everything which was said. And so, like, yeah, just hope for community building as a gesture of solidarity. So let's believe in the solidarity. Uh, thank you all, and yeah, and thank you, Maria, and thank the Eskadev platform and all the technical team for supporting us and making the stream possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here with us. From Thank you. And we're happy we still had some energy and I mean you had some energy to be here with us. Thank you Tatiana for Thank wonderful you. moderation. That was